Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our ETC Network online discussion this morning on creating strong European project proposals. As you're aware, this is a series of online discussions that we're running, and this is the second in the series. Um, and the series topics were based on feedback that we received from you as members following our last event. Uh, the format for today is very informal. Uh, there'll be no PowerPoint presentations. And the hope is that everyone will interact and actively participate in the event by putting questions to either our keynote speaker, Joe Hanley, or our host, Breathe O'Dwyer, uh, or in fact, anyone from the Southern Regional Assembly, Assembly, I'm here, and also my colleague, Karen Coughlin, or to interact with other participants that are on the event this morning. Uh, as I mentioned in our last event, there's no bad questions, except the ones that you don't ask. So this is a great environment for everyone to participate and hopefully learn from one another and hopefully you will take something from this this morning which will help you putting together future project applications during the next period. So I'd like to hand you over now to Karen Coughlin, my colleague, who will take you through some housekeeping for today. I hope you enjoy the event and that you actively participate in the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Rose, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. I think you'd agree we have two very seasoned speakers with us today, so hopefully you'll get something out of it. Just to go through a little bit of housekeeping, could I ask everybody to turn off their cameras and just to make sure that your microphones are turned off as well, just to, to save any kind of connectivity problems. And just to call your attention, we are recording the event, as you noted from the start, and we'll also be taking screenshots throughout, just to make sure everybody is happy with that. Um, throughout the event, we'd ask that the host and the speaker would keep their cameras on and everybody else, as I said, keep them off. If you do want to ask a question, feel free to turn on your camera and the host then will call you in as she sees you. Myself and Rose will also be keeping an eye on the camera, so if it is the case that um, Breed or Jer don't spot it, we will call uh, attention to you. However, if it is the case that we do miss you, at some point, please feel free to turn on your microphone and draw attention to yourself that way if we don't see your camera on. And again, once you've finished uh, talking, we would ask that you turn your camera on microphone off. I think everybody's familiar with these platforms by now, but just in case, if you go to the bottom of the screen, you'll see the microphone and the camera icon, and you can control them that way, just clicking on them, turning them off and on. Um, you also have the facility to ask questions to the chat, and we would encourage you to do so, um, and we'll direct those questions to our speakers. If it is the case that you lose connection, just please try the link again. However, if that doesn't work, you can contact Catherine, who is here to support you, and maybe I'll ask Catherine just to put her email up into the chat, and if you just want to take a note of if you do have any um, connection problems. So what I want to do is I'm going to introduce you to our host today, who's Dr. Breda O'Dwyer. And Breda is a senior lecturer and head of the Centre for Entrepreneurship and Enterprise Development at Munster Technological University. And she was a project lead on the very successful merger of IT Trulli and CIT. She's also vice president of education and practitioner learning of the Institute of Small Business and Entrepreneurship and co-chair of the OENTED SIG group. He's also been principal investigator and lead partner in a huge array of new projects over many years. Um, Breda has led a number of key initiatives in Kerry, including the region being awarded the title of a European Entrepreneurship Region, the Cantabon Conference, the European Model of Best Practice, Kerry Month of um, Enterprise, and the list goes on. So I think you'd agree we're very, very lucky to have her today. So please feel free to, to direct your questions and use her as we have her. Uh, she's also a member of national and international expert panels tasked with promoting entrepreneurial excellence. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Breda, who is our host today. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. Uh, thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Anne Rose and Southern Assembly for inviting me to host this morning. It's going to be a very interesting session, I have no doubt. Uh, we are very honoured to be joined today by Jer Hanley. And Jer is the founder of Right Fund, uh, which has a very, very uh, significant track record, shall I say, an impressive one of achieving 20 million funding in the last two years for a number of researchers and SMEs. And I guess Jer does this in association with Right Fund by really allowing researchers and SMEs to understand and realize their dreams by helping them first and foremost to identify the first that is the right funding call and second of all to, to allow them and enable them to secure the funding from that funding call. So to do that, you can imagine there's so much funding out there, so many experiences 
um, and opportunities to avail of funding. JUR has experience across instruments such as Horizon 2020 Fast Track Innovation, the Horizon 2020 Research Innovation Action, the uh, EIC SME uh, Accelerator Program, the DTIFs, and the NCSE uh, in Innovative Training and Networks, just to name some of the success she's had to date. So rather than me talking further about that, let's hear from Jar and some ideas and tips that she would share with us uh, initially on how she's achieved that. And then hopefully we can learn and co-learn further by the questions we ask. And please look forward to receiving those. So with that in mind, Jar, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Brida. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to see some of you, <laughs> and I'm sure I get to see uh, more of you as the as the uh, the morning goes on. Um, I suppose really what um, I'm going to chat to you today really about is actually one, I suppose, finding the right call, um, the the right funding mechanism for what it is that you want to do. Then, and I suppose going through then some of the tips and tricks are. Um, and pitfalls that have happened when uh, people are actually writing proposals. Um, and that I've noticed and that have happened to even um, uh, researchers that I've worked with. So um, I, hopefully that will all um, give you some help uh, today. I suppose the first thing I always go through with researchers or even with the companies that I work with is, um, is it the right call for you? You know, is it, uh, is it the right call for what it is that you're trying to do at this moment in time? So I always ask them to ask themselves three questions. So what is it that you want to actually do? And then what is it that they want is in what's the funder want <clears throat> uh, and is there a synergy and so if there's a synergy then yes okay we can start uh, plowing ahead um the next thing then is kind of i suppose to go down the next level is like is in it, it, what are they actually going to fund like as in what is it that you need them to fund and what are they willing to fund? And then also what percentage are they willing to fund? I think um, when we were chatting the other day with Brida is in it's it is sometimes that people don't actually remember or don't look at that, is that it could be like a, an 80, 20, 70, 30. Um, so you need to kind of you know look at that and can you uh, as a researcher institute SME, can you actually afford to actually only have part of it funded? So again, so that's then the next level, I suppose, of uh, the proposal. Then it's, I suppose, we're going to start with uh, the nitty gritty of the writing, okay? So when you're going to write, I always say this to everybody and everyone says, oh yeah, no, I've done this, is then you need to read the guide, you know, and you, you really do need to read the guide because the, every proposal, every funding call, it comes with a guide, it comes with, um, what, what they're looking for, what they're hoping for, what kind of impacts they want. So you really need to, to read that and make sure that you can actually do that. The, the next thing then is, I suppose, downloading whatever templates there are for the actual funding call. And again, going through those systematically, going through each and every um, item that they have highlighted, what they want, what they're saying they need in the different sections. And again, breaking that down again, actually, can you actually do that? You know, can you achieve that with the project that you want to to uh, to be funded? Um, and then once you're happy with all of that, I then always get uh, to I always start dividing out, I suppose, the instructions, the headings in uh, into like, um, uh, I suppose, project management style um, scenario where I'm working out what needs to be addressed, how long will we need to address that uh, as in writing it, um, and then basically who can actually be involved in that particular area, you know, what the, the scenario that they're looking for. Um, so you're dividing everything out, you're project managing, you're writing, um, and then basically that then helps, I suppose, in the long term to actually to meet the deadline and to meet the requirements of um, the funding agency. Um, when it comes, I suppose, then to the proposal structure, it, it, if you're being provided with a template and if the template has titles and subtitles, use them. Um, there have been um, some cases where I have researchers who've actually completely ignored the, the template and they've gone off in their own style because they preferred the way they were doing it. But you have to remember at the end of the day, you're, go, you're trying to sell your project to a particular audience. Um, and then that particular audience are going to be expecting it to be in a particular structure because at the end of the day, they could be reviewing 50 to 100 applications. So the, the, so basically keep it as the funder has, um, has set it out. So that brings me to, I suppose, the audience. Okay, so before you even start the writing uh, process is um, think about who it is you're going to be writing it for. 
So who is going to be the evaluator? What's their expertise level going to be? Are they going to be in the same um, area as, uh, as you and your expertise? Or is it a case of where you're going to have to write it a little bit more kind of in a lay um, person scenario? As in like, you're going to have to um, explain the, the, the different terminologies um, and you know that you may have acronyms for different things within your area of expertise, you need to explain those. So again, always when you're writing, always keep your audience, that reviewer in mind, okay? So what is it that, what level are they going to be? And then you write at that level. I'm not saying that you have to, I suppose, I suppose dumb down the science, it's just more that you have to be able to explain the science. They have to be able to understand it and in order to say that, yes, they think it should be funded. So the the next thing then is once you've all of that in place, you're, you know, you know, you know who your audience is, you, you know what it is that they're looking for, you know what they're going to fund. Um, and it's a case of where you're happy that you meet um, the requirements that they have. Then it's a case of, I suppose, it's the consortium. Now, I know, I think it was last week you had um, a, a good um, workshop in uh, the whole uh, building a good consortium. But once you have your consortium in place, they all need to have a part in that proposal. So they need to have tasks or deliverables or um, certain uh, even work packages assigned to them. So it, it can't be all you as, let's say, the coordinator, the person who's writing the proposal. So really you should um, involve them from the very beginning of the writing process. So it's a case of where if they're going to be, let's say you're going to have six work packages. So, and then you're going to assign a work package to each, each individual consortium member, and they're going to, let's say, lead that. So it just means then that they're invested um, from day one, which makes it then easier, let's say, when you get funded, because they're already aware of everything that's it's happening. They're already bought in. Um, and it also makes the, the writing process easier for you as a coordinator as well. So, and that's where I suppose the project management comes in. So you've everything divided out, you've got milestones as to when everything's going to be needed and required. Um, and then you, you start the writing process and you put it all together. Um, this is something I suppose is more, I think is more common sense. Um, and a lot of you probably do this already is just make sure that the important areas are highlighted, you know, so that the when the reviewer is reading it, they can see it very quickly. Oh, okay, that's okay, that's important. That's they're actually meeting um, X, Y, and Z of the requirements. So always highlight um, and bold it just to make sure that they're aware um, that you are meeting the requirements of the proposal. The other thing as well is when you're um, you're writing is to make sure that I suppose not only are you taking your audiences in the reviewer into um, consideration when you're with your writing style but also your writing format as in like your text size your um uh, the, the, the coloring the whole lot it is in if you think about it they're reading so many proposals um you need you need to consider that they might be suffering from fatigue um they, they may be fed up at this stage as in like because people are not you know using all different fonts throughout the, the the proposal and it's making it more difficult to read so i suppose those small things you know the resolution of the images make sure they're they are like the highest resolution you can do and avoid any narrow fonts. So these are just, I suppose, very basic housekeeping things. But as in at the end of the day, you're just constantly keeping the evaluator in mind. And it, it does actually make a difference because if like, let's say if I'm reviewing and if I get to the end of the day and I get a proposal and there's all different fonts, all different sizes, um, there's no cohesion. I'm going to be less, um, I suppose, uh, tolerant at that stage. And then it's a case of where you're kind of going, you're going to, to have a negative uh, view of the proposal even before you've started it, you know. And I'm not saying that, that that's, you know, that, that that's the way the reviewer should review a, a, a proposal, but it can happen. We're all human. Okay, so when it comes to the proposal itself, you need to have, um, I suppose, a clear message. So what exactly is it that you're going to do? And can, and I always try and get researchers and SMEs to do this is, can you tell me what you're going to do in a sentence? If I was, if I told you in the morning, you had to write it in a tweet, could you tweet it? So 
and again that makes it uh people start thinking because you i think uh less is more as in less text like if you can if you're able to sell it clearly in fewer text fewer uh, fewer characters it it makes it uh, a better um proposal for the reviewer you know uh, i'm not saying that it makes it a better project but it just makes it a a, a proposal that's got a, a higher chance of winning because if they can if they know from the very first page what it is that you're trying to do what it is you're selling what it is that your that impact you're going to have on society then it's they're bought in from the very first page so that you need a very clear message from from the very beginning also when you're writing and a lot of people don't do this is that um you need to be active you need to say we're going to do this you know you know again it's 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 language um and it's it's a case of where it, it's i suppose it's common sense but we don't necessarily always do that i've read a lot of proposals where oh we will probably be able to like no you, either you are or you aren't or you, that's not even english either you can or you cannot um so you need you need to specify those um but it, and again it's it's just it's it's a it's a simple thing and it and it's good um the next thing i suppose i'm going to really talk about is about budgets okay so when you're coming to uh, the budget part of the proposal um this is a thing where i think you need to to have a really good discussion with your consortium partners um, at the writing phase as to who's going to get what and how much it exactly it is that they need. So that when it then comes to signing the contracts that there's, there's no discussion as to who's getting what or that you need to redistribute the budgets. Um, another thing I, I always recommend um, is that, and it's, it's an unwritten rule, it's, it's not written anywhere, but as a coordinator or as any project partner, for large consortiums, no one person should have more than 30% of the budget. Otherwise, it's a case of why do you need all the partners that you have? You know, is in it, the, the budget should, uh, not that it has to be equal, but it should be evenly distributed. Okay, and, and just, you know, so it's a case of where um, it shows that everybody in your consortium is actually required and that everyone in your consortium has a role to play in the proposal and then also the project. Um, when it comes to, I suppose, editing down the proposal when just before you're submitting it, it, it needs to read as if one person wrote it, despite the fact that you there may be several of you all contributing to it. So again, it's going back over your proposal and refining it, uh, and just so that it's it's cohesive and coherent, um, and that it really fits every box. It, it ticks every box from the funder's uh, call uh, and what they wanted. You know what the, what the scope of the call was, what it was that they wanted from impact. Um, and just basically even just the excellence. So it's, you know, we all have really good ideas, but then it's just trying to actually, I suppose, sell it coherently across the board. Um, another thing I would say in, in regards to um, proposal writing and when you're, I suppose, at the start of the proposal writing is if you've any kind of questions or concerns, or if you're not 100% sure, or if you'd like additional advice, always go to every country um has their like let's say for horizon europe everyone there's like um the national contact points so um and then obviously then as well you've got um catherine and rose um and karen as well um locally uh, within the, the waterford office um to give you advice as well uh, you know when it comes to like uh, any questions you might have on policy or any questions you might have on a particular call whether or not you fit properly but basically always like that's what they're there for and they're more than willing to help and it, as well and that will um help i suppose with the overall proposal um because if you submit, I suppose, a proposal, no matter how fantastic it is, if it doesn't actually fit everything that the call is asking for, then you've got less chance of, um, of success. Um, to give you, I suppose, an idea about <clears throat> some successful uh, proposals, like uh, when it comes to impact. So when you're talking about impact, you're saying you've, 
you know, you're going to change society, you're going, you know, you're going to make everything better. But for every positive, there's always a negative. Um, and you should actually also acknowledge that within your proposal. Um, some of the best proposers are the ones who, who have said, well, actually, you know, we're going to put, because we're changing this, it could potentially put X amount of people um, out of a job. However, what we're planning to do is to um, retrain those uh, under another grant, uh, you know, down the line in X, Y, and Z. So you you just you you shouldn't avoid what you might think is a negative impact you because it, it's everyone you, you know when the reviewers are reviewing the proposals they know that there can be uh, a negative to every positive so if you're avoiding it then it's kind of leads a question open as in well why are they do they not realize it or is it a case of where they're avoiding it to you know to to think that we won't notice you know um and uh, I suppose a an example I use a lot is like let's say electric cars. You may say that you're going to have um, a city, a project where the city is going to become all electrified. It's going to be electrified cars. Everything is uh, going to be green. But then what about all those people that live in that city that let's say might be mechanics who work on petrol cars or diesel cars? Okay, they're no longer going to have. Um, customers you know so how are you going to deal with that or let's say you're going to go electric cars and then there's no noise so what about the children on the the road like i said they're not going to hear a car coming anymore so there's a you know so if you you know if you say this is how we're going to address this then that's you know you've more than um uh, then actually covered what it is that the the proposal is asking for when when it comes to implementation, um, I think there's some proposals that do fall down when it comes to implementation, because again, as I was saying earlier, not every consortium member will have a task. OK, so then that leads to the question is then why are they actually in the consortium? Um, another thing as well is that maybe the tasks aren't necessarily interlinked. Um, so in, in the work packages, so it's like you've all these individual um, what seems like individual projects instead of one cohesive project. Um, so you need to make sure that when it comes to the implementation that you're covering everything and you've thought of everything um, in, in that regard. So who's going to do it? How are they going to do it? Um, and then what kind of costs are involved, okay? Um, so I'm just trying to think now what else? Okay, oh, common mistakes, okay. Um, this is a big one, right? <laughs> Starting too late, okay? The minute you find out that there could potentially be a call that you're interested in, um, and even if you don't have a deadline for it, um, start working on it. Start thinking about who it is that you would like in your consortium. Start thinking about um, how it is that you would like it to be managed. If it's a case of where it's um, a funding call that that's not 100% funded, then it's like, how is your institute going to actually cover um, that cost, you know, is in that contribution? So is it going to be a case of where you're going to have um, people contributing, uh, full-time staff contributing hours? And then do you actually have enough full-time staff to actually contribute uh, to the project um, to, to cover that uh, cost? Or is it a case of where your organization actually have funding internally that actually could cover the cost? But again, all of this you need to have thought about well in advance. Um, and then I suppose as well, it's a case of where if you have any questions, you then need to make sure that you go to um, the national contact point or you need to go to the your local regional assembly to basically make sure that um, you're the right fish i suppose and that um that they're there as well that, to help you as in like once they know that you're interested then you know it's a case of where it makes it a lot easier for them to to help you out and the sooner the the better um then the other thing that i mentioned already was just about several authors and then not actually editing it down so if you don't edit it to read as one um one person wrote it, it then it makes it harder for the reviewer to read it um and you know it it just comes across then as well that you're not a cohesive consortium 
you know, that everybody is, I suppose, doing their own thing. And that's probably then how the project's going to end up working. So again, it's just those simple things that actually really make a, a, like a big difference. You, like you wouldn't think it, but it really does make a big difference. Um, make sure that you have worked out uh, as best as possible how much each of like I suppose the tasks or work packages are going to cost you know in person months um, in regards to travel expenses um, whether or not you need equipment so have all of that like really considered uh, beforehand um, because then it makes it a lot easier um, afterwards but it also shows the reviewers that and uh, evaluators that you have actually really really thought about everything um, the other thing I always uh, advise is that don't leave until the last minute to submit because um, systems can go down. Um, I don't know if, uh, if many of you had heard about the ERC. So the ERC actually had a huge problem there recently um, where um, their system went down and nobody could submit and then there was a massive panic um, and then they kept saying oh it'll be back up in a few minutes and then they brought it back up and then it died again so um, you don't need that stress um, you know I don't think any funding is worth a heart attack so basically push even if it's in draft mode put it up and then at least you have something done um, like let's say for Horizon Europe you and Horizon 2020 there's all these pre-documents that you have to fill out make sure that you actually have that started well in advance even you can start it um, before you start writing the proposal so basically have everyone fill out their individual areas and make sure that it's all um correct and accounted for because again if there's any mistakes like if you leave it to the last minute then it's a case of it's just undue uh, undue uh, pressure and strain on you um so yeah so i think other than that, they're my main, I suppose, points that I would say um, to look for um, when you're writing. Um, just, I suppose, the, the main thing is, is just always keep um, your audience in mind. Just always keep like how, you know, um, what, how they might be reading it and what their background is, um, whether or not, it, you know, there is a possibility that, you know, they have disabilities when it comes to like colors or sight, uh, like, all of these make a huge difference to an already excellent proposal. Um, but if you have any questions, then I'm more than happy to, to take them. I think, Breda, you're still on mute. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks. <laughs> I don't know where we ever learn. We keep saying this, don't we? The mute button should Sorry. off and on. <laughs> No worries. Uh, just, Ger, uh, uh, thank you very much. A lot shared in, in that time frame, uh, and, and a load of questions going through my head, and hopefully okay. we'll invite uh, questions from others. But just maybe to kick this one off, uh, yeah. to in particular, uh, quite often SMEs uh, have found that the process of going through these funding calls can be quite time-consuming, possibly yeah. with nothing at the end. And there's a question of why bother? What's in it for me? Yeah. Well, OK, so I suppose I'll give you a positive and a negative. OK, um, I worked many years ago on an interreg project where there was an, a fantastic SME involved, like really, really excellent SME. And after one year of reporting, they actually had to leave the consortium because they just the funding they were getting didn't equate to, um, I suppose, the effort they had to put in to report. So when I'm writing proposals or when I'm working with consortiums, um, I always make it very clear to the SMEs themselves about um, the different, I suppose, every every call is different and every call has different requirements, but to try and make sure that they're aware of how much administration is involved. But also, um, now this is something I've started doing myself, because I, because I used to work in universities, um, I've actually set up guides as to how to manage them and how to manage them efficiently, just in regards to, it was for my own sanity. Um, so, whereas now what I do is I actually share those with uh, SMEs when they're funded and it just makes it a little bit easier. So basically, I suppose, giving them all the pitfalls um, and then basically what they really need to keep, what they don't need to keep. But again, at the start of a consortium, I would always make that clear to the SMEs um, and that it, it's, a uh, you know, it's in for even though it may seem like it's not worth their while, it's also uh, an entry point into getting more funding. 
I always say that Brussels is very like Ireland. Once they know you, they keep giving you money. Um, so, so you know, it's a case of where they're kind of going, ah, no, they're good they, and they do good work. So, and, and that has actually happened to a lot of SMEs I've worked with, where is in, they went in on one project for a very small amount and then they, they realized, okay, we could actually probably do this in a larger amount. And now they've gone on to do very well. Um, there's actually a lady from Kerry, I think she's from, um, I could be wrong, but she's based in Spain. And her company have done fantastic out of uh, Horizon 2020. And I can see that they'll go on to do even more. But again, uh, as she said, when she started out, she said the first two grants she got, she said she nearly cried because she said there was so much once she kind of got the hang of it then. I suppose it's it's that whole thing of uh, mm. teat and keep going. You know, it will, it will work out. <laughs> It's a bit like getting on the ladder, isn't it? Just take the first step and go forward. Yeah. Exactly, Patrick, yes. question. you have a question there. Hi, Patrick. I am always delighted to hear the start off of, of these um, meetings that there's no such thing as a stupid question. It puts me <laughs> at ease. So, um, yeah, from my own um, practical experience in my role in, in the Irish South and West, we joined an interreg project. And look, we participated in the way that we could, but when it came to drawing down the funding, as you said, it was just too complicated for us. And we didn't have the resources to keep in there, even though we we mm -hmm. did as much as we could. But it, it, the work volume just, it, it was crazy. Now look, the project uh, continued and it's been finished and I'm looking forward to getting the time to go through the volumes and volumes of work that has been done in it and it was necessary work. But um, for me, um, from working in the companies that we work in, we're actually flat out, especially in our industry. There's new directives, new regulations and everything coming at us. They're constantly changing and evolving. And um, I definitely would be in breach of the recent law of being contacted out of hours for work and everything else. So look, um, I actually welcome COVID to one extent because there's no pressures on you to actually have a normal life outside uh, of work. So my question is this, is that it should be the case is that these projects, when the SMEs and other groups that are joining third level educate, uh, institutions, there has to be provision made that it's a case of catching the child by the hand and walking him through the process and taking that onerous work off them so that you actually, the participation that you want them to participate in is the key. The rest of the um, administration for them should be handled for them. Um, that's one point. The second point I want to make is then is ideas for us in SMEs, as you said, the resources to progress an idea. Um, it's virtually impossible. So that's where you again need the third level and the people with the expertise to go and knock on the door and have a think tank or say, listen, we have an idea here. Is it a runner in Europe? Is there funding here? Does it meet the criteria of what Europe is looking for? We have green um, farm to fork, the green deal, all these things that are really applicable to our industry and with everything else that's coming, we just don't have time to put our energies into that. But there's third level, like, again, I wear many hats. Um, I'm involved in the industry myself since I was 18 years of age and my son has taken over our side of the production, which is aquaculture and mussels growing and long lines. And even though I meet um, the scientists four times a year, there's one thing that drives me insane. I'm still asking for them to come down and do a study on mollusks and on Middlesex edulis, the, the, the common mussel, on the benefits that it has for the environment, carbon sequestering, um, the, the uh, bycatch, we'll call it, is seaweed that's on the lines. And all we do is just pull it off and let it float off into the tide. We don't even know whether there's a second market there for that. Or is there credit for that? It's also a natural reef for other marine life that's in the bay. And the best thing of all is that it's a filtration system and it cleans the water. Yeah. And the last thing, but most important for me, is that having these in your bay means you have a class A, a derogation for your water. And we've seen what that, how important that was for the UK um, industry, where they couldn't sell their stuff into the European that's Union without a class A. It protects your bay. It makes sure that any other activities that are going on around the bay or the, on the land has to be uh, sanctioned and looked after. But again, for me, it's an industry, and really passionate about it. I hope you get that from this. 
needs to be developed because the room for growth here is, is phenomenal. You know, it's and it, it, it's it's beneficial to everything. But and so that's my question. Is there something or some group or anybody here on this line to develop something like that? Because it's it's really required for our coastal communities. They're suffering. Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. No for, okay. um, actually, I'm going to say, if you don't mind, um, I'm working, yeah. uh, project managing a project on a part-time basis called Agrifine. And part of it, it's basically, it's a Marie Curie Innovative Training Network. So it has 15 PhD students working on 15 different projects. But one of the projects actually is on seaweed and it's based out of Bantry and the Bantry Marine um, Research Station. Um, and they're actually, the part of the project is they're actually looking at seaweed to make it into silage for cattle to eat. And then the benefits of that for cattle is in like the, the it reduces uh, the amount of methane and stuff like that, you know. So um, so there is definitely projects. Um, and actually, if, if uh, Rose or Catherine want to put us in contact, I can actually put you in contact with the researchers involved in that um, and they're actually looking to actually go again to the European um, uh, Commission like under Horizon York for further funding for more research actually into seaweed and the seaweed life uh, around Ireland and what it can do actually for the bioeconomy. Um, so uh, there's definitely people wanting to do this. So uh, I think I suppose it, uh, in Ireland in some ways we're great in one way is in that we look after each other, but we just don't know who everyone is. We need, we nearly need like a, a an SME directory <laughs> of who does what and where and how can, uh, how can we get them involved? Because that's the thing is, and I think sometimes, um, now I hope the researchers on the line don't take offense to this, but sometimes researchers are so like focused on what it is they're doing. They don't have time for anyone else, you know what I mean? So as in, but if they know you're there, then it's a case of where it's a lot easier. Um, but if you, if I can get your details, I'll definitely put you in contact with them because I think they would love to have a chat. And there's a great PhD student on it from Trinidad and Tobago who's working on it as well. So. Yeah. Patrick, if you, send me, if you send me an email after this call, then I can sure it's forwarded on to Jerry. Rose, this is Karina Hanrahan from Limerick. I actually came up two years ago the West Park Development Partnership. So I would have been very involved in that. Um, Patrick, there's we have quite. A, I don't know where you're based, but we've quite a lot of stuff down in Cork. Um, and Susan Steele, who's um. A mate of mine, she used to come in and talk to us in Ludgate about um, projects. Susan might be worth hitting up if, if you want to email me as well as Jer. And um, we've actually got a building next door in Bantry at the moment, which we're looking for funding in order to develop. So I was down with Catherine Kingston last weekend. So if I can help in any way, my brother is very involved in the farming. He's got two farms, one in Balaliki and one in Glengariff, and they're harvesting seaweed and using it for... Um, Great, for thank you very much. That's excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, now, but Patrick, I'm going to call it on this because, yeah, for the questions. I, I just want to introduce myself first because I, I, so I could have done that from the start. So I, I'm Patrick Murphy, I'm the CEO of the Irish South and West Fish Producers Organisation, but I'm a mussel farmer with, in Roaring Water Bay. It's just over in from Bentry. <laughs> but I did, I worked with Freddie, um, I can't think of the girl's second name, when we put out Hilarious. Um, seaweed in Roaring Water Bay. So I have some experience in the seaweed, but as I said, even with that, there is no link. This is the point I'm making to move it on for us or all the other mussel growers. This is a huge opportunity. It it, it really is. And we're talking can, about I, can, I, can I acknowledge that, Patrick? And I'm going to actually call it that. Just I acknowledge that, and it's been great. And I think there's a lot of help being offered on it, and certainly the connections can be made there through Jara Rose and, and the other that came on there as well. So yeah. it's great. And I suppose the other question is here in the sense of, can I just put forward a question from Terry Connolly, which is asked, uh, have any as, have any advice, uh, Jara, on adding subcontractors to an application? And, and can it really do administration being outsourced? Okay, well, if you're doing the proposal in um, in advance, like as in before you've actually been granted the grant, you can actually put in subcontractors. Uh, a, a lot of the um, the funders now allow that. I suppose there has to be a very specific reason as to why you need them, okay? Um, and that the consortium themselves um, can't do it, you know, is in once you can justify it, 
doing it after the fact once you've gotten the grant that's a little bit more complicated um, and it's also very dependent on the funder um, however I have found like let's say for the European Commission because of Covid they've been a lot more willing to kind of have um, I suppose, grant amendments and to bring in, let's say, a subcontractor if it's a case of where it means that the project will uh, get finished on time. But I suppose it really is dependent on the subcontractor. I'm, I'm here reading the, is it is it more to do with the administration or is it um, the subcontractor do actually a piece of work, I suppose, is the, the question. Terry, do you want to ask, answer that specifically or? Uh, I think it's from, it's from the SME's perspective, okay. yeah. So um, for the administration, yes, because in um, a lot of grants now do give you, um, I suppose, what we call overheads. You can actually use the overheads to um, to pay for that um, and to outsource it. Um, like, let's say for, like, I'll give you an example, like an EIC accelerator, um, like SMEs getting funded for a project that they want to do, um, they get 25% overheads, which they don't get audited on. And that money then can actually be used to either outsource it um, uh, or just to cover uh, normal um, staffing costs. Um, but I actually uh, do, um, administration as in I look after their I suppose their their books and reporting for um, the European Commission um, and then they submit it so but like as in I'm I suppose they the Commission don't know I'm a subcontractor because it's out of the the overheads um, so yeah so it, it is possible but it's very I suppose it's very dependent on the the grant in itself um, I think it does vary per call so there's no blanket answer on that yeah, yeah. Yeah. You just I suppose, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's my microphone here, Jar, but just in, in relation to the fact that another question that you know I'm sure you probably offer the service as well, whereby to review a proposal in advance of submission. Hmm. Do you offer that services? Oh yeah, no, I do. Um so I both review and evaluate um and I suppose give like what I do is I do blind reviews as in like you send it to me, I'll do, I basically review it and just give you a grade and then I'll go back then and basically go and I suppose give comments throughout the actual proposal to say where I think could what could be improved um and then you know what, what you're missing when it comes to the cost. So I, I do do that, yes. So um Great. Um, if there's other questions coming in, uh, please yeah, offer. Sure. <laughs> I just have a, a quick question um, uh, from from my perspective. I found the presentations, uh, the presentation very very interesting. But I'm just wondering when we're putting together proposals, um, mm. is it a case as well that we need to be ensured that we're not reinventing the wheel, that we don't go back to first principles, that we actually um, look at um, building on research that's already been undertaken. Mm. Well, there is that, and there's also it's a case of where I suppose something that I didn't mention is check what's already been done, what's already been funded. You know, so if you're going into a call, a call and you're saying, okay, I think this is fantastic, and it turns out it's actually already been funded, then you know you've wasted you know whatever number of months. Um, it is better to use research that's already there. I suppose the problem is sometimes when it comes to proposals is it your original research you know is in um, like is in something that was funded already you may not have been involved in um but you you've gone to the next level let's say so you know it's that the, there is that um sorry it, it, i should turn off the chats because i can see them all flashing up <laughs> so, um, but you know so it's yeah the, it's you know, not to be reinventing the wheel, making sure that you, as you said, that there, there hasn't anything else like this been funded before, then you've got a better chance, you know. Um, I think Karina's putting forward the point on that, perhaps to say that maybe with COVID, are we back to, are we back to first principles again? Because everything has changed. The whole landscape has changed. That's very true. Um, yeah. I think uh, one of my colleagues, Sarah Deverell, wanted to come on. She's the national contact point for the, the Interreg Europe, Northwest Europe. Um, Sarah, you might turn on your camera there. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, Rose. Just a quick word to introduce myself. So I work on the Interregional Northwest Europe program and I'm the national contact point for Ireland. So for anyone across the country, even though I'm based in the Southern Regional Assembly, you can contact me if you're interested in applying to this program. 
So it's interregional funding and the first calls will probably be towards the end of this year. But as Jur was just pointing out, now really is the time to start building a consortium and to reach out to different partners in different European countries that might be interested to work with you uh, and to make a nice consortium. So with that in mind, I just wanted to let everyone know that there will be um, an online networking opportunity. It's kind of an interactive webinar where you'll have the chance to meet with like-minded organizations in different EU countries. It will take place on the 10th of May at noon in Brussels time, so 11 o'clock Ireland time. Um, and I'm going to just put it into the chat. The idea is that you'll have you'll learn more about existing Northwest European projects and you can meet other stakeholders in your field and kind of get an idea of what would be funded in the future Northwest Europe program. So I can tell you already that the main themes will be around the EU objectives of a smarter Europe, so around innovation and a greener, low carbon Europe, so energy transition and so on. There'll also be some sort of social side of things in there as well. So I'll stick that in the chat and uh, invite you all to register for the webinar on 10th of May to make your own consortium. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rose. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, another question has come in there as well, Jura, in, in relation to the fact that how important is it to submit letters of support with your proposal? Um, I, th I actually, th I always recommend um, having letters of support, especially from the consortium members, if they're small SMEs or, you know what I mean, as in that basically that they have, they're confirming that they are, you know, willing to um, to put staff resources, etc., towards the project and why it's important to them. So I, I always recommend doing that, yes. So. Okay. And uh, you, you mentioned when you were presenting as well, the value of a reviewer, you know, the reviewer and these people that you know, look at these things very tightly. Is there value in people who are submitting applications to themselves experience or apply to be a reviewer of other projects? Yes, I, that's another thing I always recommend. Basically, it's like, you know, yes, it's a, it's a, it's time consuming, mm -hmm. but it's actually very beneficial because at the end of the day, if you're reviewing, you get to see what your competitors are doing, but you also get to see how the actual reviewing process works. Um, now, the, the European Commission in particular are quite good is in that they often um, um, uh, offer, you know, the reviewer package open source so you can actually see what the reviewer um, is given so that you have an idea. But I actually think until you've done it, until you've reviewed, you're never really going to know, one, the volume, to the, the level of your competitors and basically you see what's what's good what's not um another thing as well I, I recommend people doing if you know somebody who has succeeded in a funding call that you want to go into contact them and basically ask them what it is that they did like you'd be surprised like people are very open like as in you're not asking them to give you their their grant application but you're basically asking them you know what did you what worked for you you know what is what was it that you think made the uh, the winning uh, proposal um and it you know is in the people are very willing to to give this information you know so do it is in Find somebody who's already uh, won. Like, and again, you can actually um, the national contact points often know who they are, and that like is and they may be able to put you in contact. But people are very, I think, open, especially in Ireland, about uh, sharing that kind of information. So I guess to go to the national point of contact or uh, other points in Europe to become a reviewer. Um, yeah, I think you can... well, no, as in you can actually apply, um, like for the European Commission, um, at, for Horizon Europe, they're looking for experts at the moment. So you can actually go on to the funding and tender portal and apply to become a reviewer and just basically specify what areas um, you want to, um, where your expertise are um, and what you'd be interested in, I suppose, reviewing SMEs, academic, everyone can actually apply. Um, and then um, you're called um, as and when you're needed, but yeah, it's 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 a really good opportunity. You get to, uh, to I think you get to learn a lot from it. I think you also reference the point of being able to say what your project is in one sentence, and yes. I'm drawn to the fact that does that one sentence represent what the at the end will be? In other words, we will, or is it, is it a sentence that says we 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 aim to do? If you get my is it, is that sentence better to be looking as if you're at the end looking back or at the start looking forward? I I think personally I think we will you know instead of like I, I know uh, as as human beings uh, we're always kind of going oh we're aimed to doing this but mm -hmm. I think 
I think unless unless you don't believe it 100%, then really do you think somebody else is going to fund it? So I mm. always say, we are going to do this. You know, if you give us this funding, we are going to do this. Even if it's not by the end of the grant, we are definitely going to do it like maybe four or five years afterwards. You know, um, like a lot of the funding, it's not going to give you 100% of what it is that you need to do because it's, you know, the funding usually is like three years, some is five years. Um, so in three and five years, you know, realistically, you may not do everything, but you can say, well, look, we're going to do this and then we're going to get follow on funding to do this, you know, to finish it. Um, I, I think it's better to say we will than we, like it, you know, in the start of the proposal anyway, when you go down through the tasks, then you can start saying we aim to do this. But I think at this, you know, your overall vision, it needs to be we're going to do this. You know, but that's my personal view anyway. And in terms of those that are successful or more successful, shall we say, are there people who kind of go uh, after funding and make the funding fit them? Or do they try and have their idea pre-considered and find the funding to fit it? Is there a difference? Uh, yeah, there is. OK, you, you can't really make the funding fit if you know you know what I mean is in I suppose in to a certain extent I suppose you could but then trying to project manage after you've been funded is going to be a nightmare um mm. and I have worked on a project that was funded but it didn't really fit where it was if, if you know what I mean and then it just became like an it, it was a case of where I couldn't wait for the project to end just because of the fact that it, you could never actually do everything that the call had asked for even though it was funded um um, and it, they they made their idea fit the call, mm -hmm. but I suppose it, in reality it never really did. Um, you're better off just for for success rates because so many people are now applying, um, mm -hmm. and you, the competition has gotten so much higher and uh, and the quality is so much better um, that it's better you find a call that fits what it is that you're trying to do. You know, so th there has to be that synergy of that what they want and what you want actually almost matches. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you on that. And just before I ask you to to give your overall wrap up of the session, George, just also to say that there is a note there in the chat box from Charles Rorty uh, to say that Udwas the Great are also a partner in any PA project in farming seaweed. So again, yeah. that's something else to follow up for Patrick. So at this yeah. point, if I could ask you, George, to give your concluding remarks, that'd be great. Um, Could oh, I sorry. just stop there for one second, or sorry, before you start? There was a question in there as well about um, checklists, which I think are quite helpful. Now, I think that was more towards the claim procedure. But under each of the programmes, would there be a checklist of, I suppose, backup documentation that needs to go in to consider when you're putting your proposal together? Um, there, basically, I can actually send you some uh, documentation that if you want to distribute. No, not necessarily at that at the application stage. However, once you get funded, um, the grant agreements, um, they usually have everything that you need, the different, you know, especially I know under the European Commission, they detail everything. I also know in Interreg there, there is a detail of what you need, um, but it's usually you're not given that until afterwards. However, it's um, I can give it to you, like as in, um, I can send you on some documents that basically um, I use to create checklists so that the SMEs know what they're getting into. And that's how I did it, is basically I took grant agreements and broke it down as to, as so that when an SME was talking about getting into a consortium, just so that they say, this is what you're going to be getting into. Um, but yeah, really I, help I, I you yeah. can disseminate them then to the, to the yeah. wider group. Yeah, great, thanks. <clears throat> um, so, are there any more questions or is that it? I, I think somebody yeah. asked about reviewer, um, you apply. Um, just with the for Horizon Europe anyway, you go through the the, the funding and tender portal to apply um, uh, to become a, a reviewer. So, any final words as we close the session today? Um, I suppose the main thing is don't be put off. Um, <laughs> I think um, I I think it's a case of where you have to be bold and brave. Um, and it's not insurmountable, you know, even for SMEs. I know the the amount of paperwork uh, once you get funded, it, it becomes like, you know, a nightmare, but it, or it feels like it's a nightmare. But 
I suppose if you're aware of it in advance, you know, it's in, I think the funding is there for everyone and everyone should be able to, you know, go into the consortiums and shouldn't fear going into the consortiums because the more funding you get, the actual, the easier it gets. Um, and I know that sounds like, yeah, sure, whatever, but no, it does, I promise. <laughs> um, and I suppose the other thing as well is like, um, you know, if a call doesn't suit, the likelihood is, is that there's going to be more calls that will, you know, there's, there's so many different funding agencies, not just in Europe, even it's a case of where you can actually get funding from America um, to do research in Ireland, you know, so it's, you know, just keep looking, it, it is there, you know, so, um, but it's, uh, it's, you shouldn't be afraid. <laughs> so uh, definitely don't be afraid, go for it. Sure, thank you very much. And I think with a track record of 20 million funded secured in two years, I, I, I'd go with what you're saying. Thank you. Back to you, Rose. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this morning and for your uh, active participation. Uh, in particular, I want to thank our keynote speaker, Ger Hanley from Right Fund, who uh, shared her insights and expertise and has offered to send us on other documentation, which will assist us going forward. Um, so thank you very much for that, Ger. Uh, Dr. Breather O'Dwyer, thank you very much for hosting the event this morning and for keeping it um, animated and to uh, and keeping it going. Um, I'd say we could probably have continued this session for maybe another hour, uh, but we really appreciate you supporting the ECC's network and hosting this morning. Um, I also would like to thank Catherine, uh, who works with the Southern Regional Assembly, who looks after all the technical aspects of these events and uh, who sits in the background helping people when they have difficulties. So thank you for that. Um, could I ask everyone that's here if they wouldn't mind now turning on their cameras uh, and we'll take a nice screenshot that we can put out on social media to thank you all for your participation. Just to let you know that as this is a series of um, online discussions, uh, our final discussion in the series will be on virtual stakeholder and public engagement. Um, and the keynote speaker at that will be Kate Morris, who is the head of Campus Engage with the Irish Universities Association. And our host, who is actually with us today, Stefan, Stefan Cock from UCC and Cork Transport Mobility Forum will be your host on the day. And that's next week on the 29th of April, 2021. And I think my colleague has put the invite link into the chat there. So finally, I'd like to thank you all again for your engagement. I think it was a use, very useful and beneficial um, uh, online discussion and I hope everyone got something from it that will assist them in their project applications in the next programming period. So thank you very much. We're just bang on time at 11 o'clock. Really appreciate your participation and hope to see you all again next week. Take care everyone. Bye. Thank you.